Welcome back. This is week five, lecture two, um, the Reformation of the Refugees, Calvin, uh, Geneva, is it Calvin, Geneva in France. I have to even look at what I'm doing here. Calvin, uh, Geneva in France. Yes, there we go. Um, I should know my own titles. Anyway, um, this lecture continues with then a, a, another quote unquote pattern of Reformation, namely the Reformation of the Refugees. And I'll be talking more about that uh, as we go through. But it it is distinguished from um, the, the Radical Reformation in all kinds of ways. But one is that whereas the Radical Reformation, one of the things I mentioned as a general characteristic was that the Radicals lacked any political base um, from which to launch their movements and proselytize and, and gain converts and have an established home base, so to speak. And with the Reformation of the Refugees, it would seem uh, to be similar in that we're talking about refugees, and refugees are people who have fled, um, fled their home. And so it would seem that the Reformation of the Refugees doesn't re don't really didn't really have a base of political territory. But we will see how that was not really the case, and that's why they um, have been called the Reformation of the Refugees, because they found their base in Geneva. Uh, Geneva, of course, is, is not French. It's a, it's a Swiss city. Um, and we'll be talking more about that as we go along. But there was this very close connection between Geneva and what was going on with in terms of Reformation in, in France. And that link was primarily um, due to John Calvin. John Calvin, or in French, Jean Calvin, was um, a second-generation reformer, and what we mean by that is simply that he was younger than Luther. Calvin was born in 1509 in Noyon in France, and in 1509, that is when Luther had already become a, a, a full-fledged Augustinian hermit, you know, has already been ordained and said his first mass, and he had was beginning to study theology uh, in Wart Wittenberg, or Air Force, excuse me, in Air Force in 1509. And Calvin is just being born. And so by the time Calvin grows up and becomes aware of what's going on in the wider world, he's already aware of this conflict. If we just think about it chronologically, in 1520, Calvin is 11 years old. In 1520, and then 21 with the Edict of Worms, Calvin in 1521 is you know 12 years old when Luther is excommunicated and stands at the um, Diet of Worms. So in that sense, it's second generation in that Calvin grew up within a Europe, within a France that was already being... Um, filled with tensions and conflicts over the question of religion and politics and, and social unrest. And that kind of changes how we approach him and view him. So today we can just always think of, you know, Luther and Calvin, the two great people, and they, they were hugely important. Um, and in the sense of to us today, they weren't really, though, contemporaries at all. I mean, Calvin knew about Luther, and Luther... Uh, eventually knew about Calvin, um, but they're kind of a different context, and especially with the French aspect, we'll talk more about that as well, um, where Calvin grew up, um, there were issues there that, that were very different from Luther. Calvin had a different background, um, even if there are very, some similarities, and we'll be talking about some of those as we go through. Um, he ends up in Geneva, becomes the reformer of Geneva, um, and we'll see how that came about. And that provided the base for um, Calvin's Reformation. We could just call this Calvin's Reformation, um, or we could call it, you know, Reformation in France, even though Geneva's not in France, but that was Calvin's whole perspective and intent was towards France, to convert France. And we'll see how that came about as well. But he had fled and a number, a lot of people, a number of people, a fair number of people had fled France, as I'll be talking to, going to Geneva and learning from Calvin, studying with Calvin, or they fled uh, to London. There's a, a refugee community of French Protestants um, that looked to Calvin. So Calvin becomes this central figure, and Geneva be provided a political base for these 
um, French Protestants. But we'll be talking more about that as we go. But that's why these are all put together under the broad term, the Reformation of the Refugees. Um, that is a term that my Dr. Vater, uh, Heiko Obermann, uh, coined. Um, I don't. I think it's, I don't think Lindbergh even mentions it. You know, Lindbergh certainly talks about Geneva and talks about Calvin, talks about France, but not with that term. Um, but I hope you'll see the validity of it as a descriptive term for some of these developments that seem to be kind of dispersed, lacking a real unity. But this concept of re reformation of the refugees kind of brings cohesion to. Um, a series of developments that otherwise might not see uh, be seen as part of the same quote unquote thing, whatever that might be, if that makes sense. So anyway, that's kind of the, the overall perspective of what we're going to be looking at today. Um, this is a fascinating period in, in French history, um, it, in an exciting period, and also one that we will see shows the... Um, almost the serendipitous nature of history and the fickleness of history um, when you can't plan for things necessary because accidents happen and change history immensely but we will see you will see what i mean by that when we get there um it, it this led to a series of of uh, civil wars in france france known as the uh, french wars of religion but they were basically civil wars um and then to a solution uh, which is somewhat, or was somewhat, um, not all that different in terms of type uh, from the Peace of Augsburg. But we'll see that when we get there. In other ways, it was very different uh, from the Peace of Augsburg. But we'll, we'll get there when we get there. Okay, that's what we're looking at. So, we first need then to look at the context of France um, in the early 16th century and what happened and what was going on in France when Calvin was growing up and becoming um, a, a scholar. Because Calvin um, wanted to be, uh, wanted to study the classics. And I don't have this part on the slide, it's in your, I think it's in your textbook. Um, and I just realized when I was reviewing the, the PowerPoint slides, I don't really have a section on Calvin uh, and such in his early biography. So I'm just going to do this now in terms of uh, France and the evangelical movement in France. Calvin, Calvin's father wanted him to go to law school and wanted him to study law. Calvin went to uh, Paris and studied at the University of Paris. Um, and then he was attracted to the humanities to the to the to humanism to the study of the classics and actually his first publication in 1532 was uh, a commentary on the roman author seneca's uh, work treatise on clemency or de clemencia on mercy and calvin wrote a, a classical commentary on that work so he's he was very in, uh, filled with um, with classical scholarship, Greek and Latin, uh, primarily Latin too, but his Greek was probably better than Luther's Greek. Um, and he was in that humanist context as it was spreading in France and spreading throughout the universities of Europe as such. If you remember, um, humanism developed in the uh, Italian cities um, as uh, a study of the humani aura, the humanitates and the and Technically, the humanists were the, the teachers of the humanities, the studia humanitati, the, the study of the humanities. And it only slowly, only to, towards the end of the 15th century, became incorporated within the universities. And then it began to be uh, an important aspect of university culture and life in the curriculum. Uh, in Wittenberg, uh, Luther hailed this uh, as a major event with the Reformation, at Wittenberg, and that was one of the um, historical meanings of the term Reformation, was university reformation, reformation of university curricula, um, primarily inter the introduction of humanism into the universities and the textual scholarship and then the biblical scholarship um, and what all that meant. So and that was that this new kind of educational excitement was what uh, had captured Calvin's imagination. And so even though he did study law, 
he, uh, especially after his, I believe it was only after his father died, he went back to Paris to focus on the classics and the liberal arts. Um, and at this point in the early 1530s, um, humanism had led to um, calls for reform. I think I mentioned, had mentioned before that some of the, the humanists uh, were early supporters of Luther. Um, some continue to be. Uh, Philip Melanchthon, of course, was a humanist. Um, but other humanists, such as you know, Erasmus, realized that there were problems in the church um, that needed fixing, but didn't want to go so far as to really break from the tradition, etc. Luther's w was being read in, in France. Luther's works were being read in France, often in French translations. But in the context of the, the this humanistic approach and call for reform and, and betterment, we need to clean up the church. And part of that, the foundation of that, is classical scholarship. Because what is classical scholarship primarily? It's textual scholarship based on the sources. And in the North, as I said, focused on um, the biblical text and how we read the biblical text and i think i even talked about the, the influence on, on luther uh, some of these ideas and concepts coming from humanism and textual scholarship and literary scholarship with the scopus scripturae the main point of a text as the means for interpreting the entire text now calvin was not only interested in that but then participated in it but it, it, he certainly didn't initiate it it had been growing there had been circles humanist circles um, in France, so it reformed France, that were uh, focused on, you know, discussing and commenting on ideas of how to go about bringing, bringing reform to the church. And so, and one of the major uh, circles um, was in Meaux, the city of Meaux, um, which is uh, in the north of Paris, um, centered at the bishop's residence, the, the, the Bishop of Meaux, uh, Bris, uh, uh, Brisonnet, Bishop Brisonnet, and other bishops were involved too. Moreover, some of these various reform circles, including at Meaux, were coordinated. And one of the leading figures coordinating this network of evangelical, because they, they were called evangelical too, because they are trying to get back to the gospel, i.e. what Luther was saying, even if not in Luther's understanding of that, but going back to the gospel in the sense of a humanist reform ideal. But the organizer of this network was actually the sister of the King of France, Marguerite. Marguerite of Valois um, would be writing letters to, to, to these different uh, uh, leaders of these different circles and kind of tried to act as the supporter of these movements and developments and discussions um, and as well as the organizer uh, and make sure that they could talk to each other and were aware of what was going on on a broader scale than the locality. Now, there was again issues of heretical literature that was coming into france uh some of luther's works there was issues of you know translating the bible into french um and some of the you know that, that was going on as well uh at least individual books and psalms primarily so there began to be the, again, this evangelical movement and francis the first didn't really care francis the first king of france uh i've mentioned um in my view, I like to call him is, is the first early modern monarch. Um, he's the one that had the, the wars with Charles V, the Habsburg Battle Lot Wars. Um, and Charles, as I've termed him, it was the last medieval emperor. <coughs> and Francis didn't really care what was going on, especially with his sister being involved. It's like, fine, sis, go off, do whatever. You know, it's, but things were going to change. Things were going to change uh, after Calvin was in Paris. Uh, and how did that change come about? Well, one of the, Calvin's colleagues in, in Paris uh, was a man by the name of Nicholas Kopp, C-O-P. And Kopp uh, actually became rector of the university. Now, that today, that office of rector uh, is a very 
prestigious office um, in a, your European universities. It's like the chancellor here. Um, the chancellor even you know has a, a tone of even elevated uh, above that of president uh, to the chancellor of the university and the rector magnificus, uh, as it's often called um, in Europe at European universities. Has today that that kind of that sentiment, but in the medieval universities and on into the 16th century, even at Paris, the rector uh, was usually a recent graduate in the arts, so a relatively young person who was uh, uh, named as rector to kind of oversee the undergraduate education, and, and, and so. And this so Nicholas Kopp was relatively young. I don't really know. I mean, he was a contemporary of Calvin uh, in, in the 1530, early 1530s. Calvin was in his early 20s. So was then Cop, most likely. Um, and Cop gave an address that got him into a lot of hot water because it was based on um, what needed to be done to reform the university and therefore the church. And this was basically at the same time that... Um, an event took place in Paris and throughout France that changed everything, namely the uh, affair of the placards, uh, which was in October uh, 1534. I forget, I mean, October 18th, I think uh, it was, 1534. Now, what was the affair of the placards and how did they change things? A placard is simply a broadsheet, which I talked about when I was talking about uh, pamphlets. It's a one page um, printing d uh, designed for very quick distribution. This placard uh, or broadsheet was uh, critical of the mass, attacked the mass, attacked the papacy in Rome, um, far beyond what was being discussed in the uh, humanist circles, even though it was seen as associated with these evangelical reform circles in France, especially also at Mo, um, which was beginning to be seen uh, after the affair of the placards as this seed bed of heresy. Um, and it was printed and spread all over France overnight. One of these placards was even attached to the bedroom door of Francis I. So when Francis wakes up in the morning, what does he see? This placard. And he's like, damn it, no more. This is heresy. My title as king of France is I am the most Christian king. I stem from Charlemagne. I mean, he was a Valois, so that's not directly, but the lineage goes back to Charlemagne in his mind. I am a divine ruler appointed by God. And how dare anyone undermine that authority? And that changed Francis's approach to evangelical movements, the humanist reform movements without France. Overnight, it switched from benign tolerance, not caring, to active persecution and seeking out of the heresy. Since Cop was seen as one of the leading figures of the evangelical reform humanist circle in Paris, at the University of Paris, after his speech that he gave, and since Calvin was very closely associated with Cop in this new atmosphere of persecution, when Francis is saying, I'm going to go seek out and rid France of this heresy. Now, he didn't start with his sister. I mean, his sister is probably just like Marguerite. Damn it. Shut up. <laughs> Stop it. But he went to, to seek out, and there were burnings. People were captured. Uh, I, I, Brice Renee, I'm not sure what happened to him and Mo, but there were, you know, people in Mo were, I think, were, were uh, captured and burned. Um, and it was very, a very tense situation. Cop and Calvin said, you know, we actually probably better get the hell out of here because we're liable uh, to be brought up for heresy charges. So they flee. Calvin goes to Basel. Basel was in Switzerland, um, not that far from France. Um, and there 
in Basel in 1536. So just two years uh, after the affair of the placards. Calvin publishes uh, first edition of his major work, which was to have a huge impact. And I'll be talking about that as we go along. Um, originally referred to as the Institute of the Christian Religion. And in that work, he writes a preface, a uh, prefatory letter to Francis I. And that is part of your reading for this week, Calvin's letter. And I'll be talking more about that because this letter um, is published with every subsequent edition of the Institutes and their translations. I mean, the Institute, uh, Calvin's first edition in 1536 was published in Latin. Uh, French translations quickly follow. Um, it keeps revising, but I'll be talking about that on a later slide when I talk about the Institutes more directly. Now, you can ask me, well, what happened to Cop? And I'll have to say, I don't know. Uh, I honestly don't know. He doesn't reappear as a major figure, to be quite honest. Uh, at least to my knowledge. I could be way wrong on that. Uh, but to my knowledge, uh, he just flees and gets out of there. We don't know what happens to him. But Calvin, we do, of course. By this time, Calvin... Um, realizes that he has broken from the church so what does he have to do um, he has to well he doesn't have to but he does he says you know I, I i need to put my money where my mouth is i am going to um, resign my ecclesiastical benefices now what is a benefice a benefice is the income from a given parish used to support university students. It was the, the 16th century, the medieval, uh, uh, medieval uh, continuing into the 16th century, uh, means of, of financial aid, so to speak, um, or bursaries, as they were later called. The idea would be that if you were receiving income from a parish, after your studies, you'd go back to work in that parish, either as a teacher or you know, become ordained as a priest. Interesting thing about Calvin, even when he publishes the Institute of the Christian Religion in 1536 in Basel, Calvin had never studied religion, or theology, excuse me. He had never studied theology. He had been trained as a lawyer and as a classicist, as a humanist. And he never did study theology. He did it on his own. And he came to the realization that, yeah, you know, I can no longer be within this church in this setting when, especially in the light of persecution, um, I need to work towards converting France too. So it would be hypocritical of me to maintain my income um, when I have no intention of going back to help the people. Uh, who were paying me to get my education. And the thing is, too, as it developed uh, these concepts of benefices throughout uh, in the later Middle Ages, high later Middle Ages, is a single student could have hold multiple benefices to receive income from multiple parishes. Um, and so Calvin had to, to go to every parish that was uh, from which he was receiving a benefice to uh, give up his benefice, uh, resign his benefice. So as he was doing that, um, he ends up in uh, Geneva. And that will be a later story, uh, basically. Um, or I'll come back to his time in Geneva because he becomes the, the reformer of Geneva. But here I have, you know, after Calvin flees, this is still the first slide or the second slide of the evangelical movement in France. Calvin flees and I have the Protestants in France are underground because a result of the persecution, if you didn't flee, if you didn't leave France, what is the other option? You could no longer stand up and advocate for even humanist reform necessarily because that was too suspect of the evangelical heresy after the affair of the placards that Francis was stamping down on. So you had to go underground. And this brought up the issue of, you know, do we flee or do we stay? What do we do? And in some ways that had been the question when someone, when you were being faced with persecution, going all the way back to the Donatus controversy. What do we do? Do we go underground? Or do we flee? Because if we stand up, we'll be martyred or killed. That was the choice in France. That was the choice that, Frank, uh, that, that, that Calvin had and that the French evangelicals 
had. Now, you know, I'll come back to the whole development of, of Calvin and Geneva, but working in Geneva, Calvin still was primarily concerned for France. And up there we have the Genevan French connection. There was almost an underground railroad whereby people would flee from France to Geneva to study with Calvin. And then he would send them back into France to be underground to spread the gospel and to teach people, you know, by this time, you know, Protestants with a Protestant position, um, uh, calling for pretty radical ref reform of the church, not only just throwing off Rome, but getting, trying to get the nobles and the king to see that Rome is corrupt. Not just corrupt, it's wrong. It's, you know, you know I, I don't know if, if Calvin, uh, he probably does, but I can't say I know off the top of my head if and where um, Calvin refers to the Pope as the Antichrist. And so, but, you know, Luther had already been doing that. He certainly, Calvin certainly would have kind of agreed, more or less. So it's this sense of, of fighting evil in their eyes that is so essential, makes it imperative. They would, you know, um, smuggle evangelical works into France. They would sm smuggle French translations of the, the Bible, at least of the Psalms and the Gospels and things. Um, they would sm uh, smuggle in French translations of Luther's works. So, but all this was done underground, and it was a real problem. I have, I have up there, and then Calvin's attack on the Nicodemites, and that comes a little bit later. And Calvin um, started, based, I mean, based in Geneva, criticizing the French Calvinists, or the French Protestants, uh, or later Huguenots, uh, Huguenots, as they were called, or Huguenots. The Huguenots, the Huguenots, as they were called, um, and we really don't know the origins of that term. It has been suggested for a couple of things, everything from um, being uh, being a reference to the Swiss, the Adgenossen, um, to going back to an earlier French uh, royal dynasty, the the, the the Capetians from Hugh Capet. So I, I'm not going to, don't really know why, but they, they were referred to as the Huguenots, the, the French Protestants, but the Huguenots were simply French Protestants. And the French Protestants were primarily, I can't say every single one of them, but overwhelmingly based on Calvin's influence and the earlier humanistic reform uh, elements as well. But Calvin, again, once he's established in Geneva and he has this process going, he sh maybe should have known better, but he writes a tre treatise condemning what he called the Nicodemites in France for not being willing to stand up for their beliefs. Now, Nicodemus, some of you may know, figure in the Bible, he was, you know, a, a, a Pharisee, comes or came to Jesus at night um, and wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. He was afraid of going to Jesus, uh, listening to Jesus during the day in the open. So he kind of hid under the cover of night um, to kind of seek out uh, what Jesus was saying. Um, and yet, he's there at the cross. So he was a faithful disciple, or became a faithful disciple, but he still was hiding. Calvin critiques that and condemns them for not standing up. The leader of the underground Protestant movement in France, uh, who wrote under the name of Antoine Fumé, uh, which has been suggested was a, a, a pseudonym because Fumé means burning. And he said, you know, um, a flame, uh, wrote back a scathing attack on Calvin. Basically, Calvin, who the hell do you think you are? You are there safe in Geneva. You fled. We stay. If we speak out, we will be burned. That's what we are facing. We can't speak out and stand up. We can't be defiant. We are not denying the gospel at all. This is a survival mission. And this gets back to the issue of, you know, what do you do?
What do you do? What would you do if you were living in the Netherlands in 1944 um, and you were um, hiding the Jews in your home and the SS knocked at your door? We said, we hear that you are hiding Jews. Do you, would you stand up and say, you're damn right I'm hiding Jews, you son of bitches, and you're not going to get them? What would happen if you replied that way? If you stood up for your convictions and your beliefs? You'd be dead, the Jews would be dead. But if you say, what? No, I'm not hiding any Jews. You know, I don't really like Jews, actually. Um, you know, hey, I, I think my neighbor has some Jews, actually. I just got the wrong house here. Now, selling out your name, I mean, I hope you know I'm making this to be farcical. But the point is extremely serious. What do you do when faced with persecution? And standing up is one thing, but is that the best means of serving your purpose? That was the tension that was there. Calvin was safe in Geneva. Geneva was a Protestant city. Had been even before Calvin got there. He was safe. When we talk about the Reformation of the refugees, that concept of professing your faith in the face of persecution is central. And it's central for understanding Calvin's mentality too because Calvin understood the threat of persecution. He understood the problems of being an alien resident of not being home, of being a refugee. And he knew his Augustine so well that he knew that that was how Augustine referred to all Christians, really, who were, were, were peregrini, were resident aliens, making their way back home with God. Calvin understood that very well. So why he attacked the Nicodemites, we don't know. And but that's another issue. That was the kind of the, 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 the sense of what was going on in France in the course of the later 1530s on into the 1540s and 1550s as Calvin's ideas are spreading and they are gaining converts. And, and not only among you know, the populace in general, but also among the princes of the blood, as they were called. The princes of the blood. Um, not all nobles were princes of the blood. Princes of the blood is a term that refers to those in the direct line of royal succession. Um, you know, if you any of you have been following, um, you know what's been the coronation of Charles in France, in, in England today, um, and the whole different various lines and the you know debacle and the circus surrounding Harry and Meghan and all that other stuff. Um, that succession is important and. You know, who is going to ascend to the throne, or theoretically, who could ascend to the throne? And the success, question of succession, and here I'm not talking about the TV show, but it's somewhere, somewhat uh, related in some ways. The problem of who is going to succeed to the throne has, was always a major question for European politics. And in England, uh, even though, again, I don't have a lecture on the Reformation in England, but that, was, that question was behind Henry VIII's attempt to get a divorce from Catherine because his father had come to the throne during the Wars of Religion, or excuse me, during the War of the Roses, um, which was a war over succession. That can lead to civil war, and there's nothing worse than civil war. So the question of succession is central. It wasn't simply Henry's libido or his lust or whatever. It was, we need to provide an heir for the throne. Now, of course, he blamed Catherine for that rather than himself. Obviously, it wasn't him. Um, but that gets into all those you know, fun issues, uh, again, of history. Because if Catherine had produced a few sons, it would have been fine. And probably never would have been a reformation in England. But the point here is, though, um, succession is a major issue. And those who are in 
line of succession and not when i say direct line i mean somehow related to this the, the lineage because if you're first I mean, it's pretty clear if you're the a king and your your eldest son is first and your the next oldest son is second and your third oldest son is third if you have it but if not then it, where does it go and it could go to other different branches of the family and so the princes of the blood are all of those uh princes and nobles who are in that kind of pyramidic hierarchy of lines of succession. They had a special status. And there were princes of the blood that had become Protestant, that the, you know, had, had come to see that Calvin was right and that the Protestant position was right. And they took up the reins of leading the French Protestants, the Huguenots, were being led by the princes of the blood, and only as such could there be any question of a transitioning of French Protestantism from being in hiding underground to being in open opposition to the monarch, to uh, society at large, as well as to the papacy, because it's one thing for you know, the monarch, the king, to... Uh, round up a bunch of heretics and burn them. It's another thing if you were to do that uh, with the princes of the blood. This was to lead to uh, developments of political theory, some of which I'll be talking about later. And especially when we see later on in this lecture, I was one of these princes of the blood, uh, Protestant Huguenots, Huguenots, who actually did become king of France. But we'll get there when we get there. But that's kind of the context of what's going on in France. Um, as Calvin is working from Geneva, um, he's kind of safe in Geneva. The French movement was developing with the French underground, uh, and Calvin's f almost focus was more on France than it was on Geneva and the Swiss. Um, and it was being successful. At least it was making inroads, and it were, was gaining converts, including the important converts of some of the princes of the blood, which gave the movement legitimacy. Now, that being said, we need to stop back um, and go to see how Calvin came to Geneva, what he was doing in Geneva, and the importance and impact of his developments in Geneva, in addition to those in France, because the whole point was that as Calvin was developing his Reformation program in Geneva, that was to be the model for everywhere else. And so the French Protestant movement was, was, was theoretically to be modeled on what was going on in Geneva. And Geneva provided the, the political base for Calvin and his movement. Now, how did Calvin get to Geneva? I think I mentioned that Calvin, um, when he fled and went to Basel, and when he realized he needed to, or when he decided um, to kind of go around and uh, resign his benefices, Calvin, in his travels, went through Geneva. Um, and this is in 1536. And Geneva had already been struggling to reform itself. Um, they kicked out their bishop, uh, their, or they at least proclaimed themselves independent from their bishop. Um, and there was an Episcopal residency in Geneva that and they said, you no longer are welcomed here. So there's this issue of, again, the political issue, an economic issue of church lands, church property, and when we introduce the Reformation, what happens to that? That was very clear in terms of cities, and Geneva, but also in terms of territory. We see that too in England, when you know Henry the Fourth, Henry the Fourth, Henry the Eighth in England, um, you know, after the Act of Supremacy in 1534, uh, shortly thereafter, he dissolves the monasteries and appropriates the church lands. There was a huge financial benefit to turn Protestant, or to turn, in some ways, uh, as a, a great book uh, uh, by Tom Brady, uh, not the quarterback, uh, the historian is, it's called Turning Swiss. Um, this is back in the, in the 80s, I think it came out, but it's still a great book. 
about reformation in, in, in the empire imperial cities which includes the swiss cities and that these swiss cities of independence and kicking out their bishops um, was a model for reformation and actually a colleague of, of mine from graduate school uh, school wrote his dissertation and, and then turned it into a book uh with the title you know episcopus exclusus knocking out and excluding the bishops throwing off the bishops and Geneva had already done that beginning in 1525. Bern was the most powerful um, Swiss city at the time. It had already done that, so Bern is trying to help Geneva, but Geneva doesn't really want to just be a, a, a satellite of Bern. So they're trying to go their own way. They uh, appreciate Bern's support as another Protestant city state, and these again, the, the, the Swiss cities are city states. They're independent sovereign entities. And that's what the, the Eingenossen is, the, the, the confederation, the Swiss confederation is what we're really talking about. Confederation of, of city-states. And they are not just within the city walls, but with their territories. So Geneva, even though it's thrown out, out their bishop, the Bishop of Constance, um, they're also wary about being sucked under the authority of Baron, which they don't really want either. They said, we need to kind of work on this. And there was a, a figure that was there working and helping Genevans uh, to bring about a reformation. Still going on 10 years later, William Farrell, Guillaume Farrell, an older man, um, but was working to try to help the Genevans establish, you know, what do we do with the church lands? How do we handle um, worship services? Um, what do we do about the sacraments? How do we, what do we do about, you know, confession? What do we do about a lot of these things? And they made a lot of progress, but there was always this tension. And when Calvin came through, Pharrell recognized him and said, you know, Master Jean, John, you need to stay with me and help me reform Geneva. Help me bring these damn Genevans into some kind of disciplinary form that we can make a, a, a real go of this. We've been trying for almost 10 years. They're always resistant. Calvin says, well, I really don't want to. I have my own deal I, I need to work on. And Fernal says, you know what, Calvin? God will damn you if you don't help me. Calvin, he's struggling. He asks, goes back and asks Butz, Butzer what he should do in, in, Stra in, in, in Strasbourg. Um, but that was actually that, that was later. But anyway, but he you know he he's trying to figure out what to do. He does decide to stay and help Pharrell. So for a, a while, then from 1536 to 1538, Calvin is working together with Pharrell in Geneva, trying to make this city reflect the Reformation ideals. We talk about the, the visitations with Luther in 1527 uh, and the shock that it was with Luther in terms of what really has changed. That was somewhat without the visitations. What Pharrell was facing, what Calvin was facing with Pharrell there in 1536, and that, okay, it's not just ideas, it's how do we actually change people? Not only their beliefs and what they might uh, adhere to, no problem that they go to, you know, to, to church, but do they go to church as often as they're supposed to? Um, they don't really care about what's going on in the Pope. Okay, okay, we no longer follow the Pope. Great, okay. <laughs> now what? Yay, we don't have to worry about the Pope. So, what do we do now? And Calvin and Pharrell were frustrated. They tried to impose discipline, rules, regulations for the Genevans to follow, to be reformed, to be Protestant. The Genevans resisted. This was all based on the city council. The city council had supported Pharrell. The city council had supported then Pharrell bringing, bringing in Calvin. The city council had voted to decide to expel the archbishop or their bishop in, 15, or in 1525, <laughs> 26. The decision of the councils, which are, as I said last week, are, are magistrates, was essential. 
Now, in Geneva, as in most cities, there was the large council, which consisted of all male citizens. Um, of course, you can't be a citizen if you weren't male to begin with. And you had to own property to be a citizen, so it was all you know, free property-owning males. Um, and that was the large council. They met once a year or so, but the, the real power was in the small council. And the small council, I believe, had about 200 in it at, at most. Um, they effectively governed the city because they would meet monthly or so and they had you know offices to establish uh, to, to run the city on a daily basis but the real power was in the city council and in 1538 there was a new election and a faction came into the city council that had had enough of of Calvin and Pharrell. So they said, okay, you know, get the hell out of here. We don't need you anymore. We can't stand you. We hate what you're trying to do to us. Get out. So they left. They had to leave. And Calvin, and Calvin instead of going back to Basel, went to Strasbourg. Uh, and the reformer there, Martin Bootser, said, okay, Calvin, uh, I want you to uh, come here and, and, and be pastor to French Refugee Church, even though uh, Strasbourg was this French and German-speaking territory. Um, Basel was, when he first went to Basel, it was basically only German-speaking, and Calvin didn't speak German. But in Strasbourg, Strasbourg is there in the Alsace and the Lorraine, uh, that had gone back and forth between France and Germany and continued to do that all the way to World War One or World War II. Um, so it was a bilingual city. So Calvin was serving the French refugee community, refugee community who had fled from France, the persecution, to Strasbourg, um, which was an imperial free city. And there um, was thought he'd be good to go for and, and stay there, really continue his, his work there and his work for, for France. However, the Genevans, things weren't going that well <laughs> for the Genevans. Wait, we kick you out? Um, now what? What do we do now? And they struggled. They weren't making uh, much headway. Um, what does it really mean to uh, to assert that we are preaching the pure gospel? What, and how do we find pastors to do that? What do we, you know, how do we live and all these other things? And so in, 15, in 1540, um, uh, it's like, what do we do? It's like, well, maybe we should ask Calvin to come back to help. Now, Pharrell, he was old. We're not going to get him back, but let's, maybe we could convince Calvin. So they uh, approach Calvin. They say, please come back to help us here in Geneva. And Calvin's like, no way in hell. I'm going to go back to, to you people. Calvin had a very tense relationship with the Genevans throughout his life. And here was like, no way. You kick me out. You guys are pigs and dogs. Um, interestingly enough, there are stories about Genevans naming their dog Calvin and then kicking their dog around. Poor dogs. That's not a very good way to treat dogs. I'm a dog lover, but it you know, makes a, a good impression in terms of, of that. And they said, well, you know, we're, we're sorry. We, we really do need you. Uh, he says, no, I'm not going to do it. He says, well, what can we offer you? How about, you know, they offered a pretty nice salary. He said, no, I'm not interested. They said, well, you can live in the Episcopal residence. He said, no, no. They said, well, we'll even pay for your, an ermine coat for you, which is pretty big incentive there. Calvin still said, no. And they said, is there anything that we could offer you that would make you come back. Calvin said, well, after talking with Bootser, uh, the reformer of Strasbourg, um, I'll take what you've offered, but it, w w the only thing that will seal the deal is if you pass I mean, the city council, the city council, if you will pass my ecclesiastical ordinances, now, an ordinance is a law, and Calvin had been working on producing this document, um, as well as continuing to revise his institute, which we know better as the Institutes of the Christian Religion, um, f f while he was there in, in Strasbourg. It's a series of rules and regulations of laws of how the church, the church should be organized 
and what the penalties were and for people who did not follow along um, and basically how the Reformation should be. And the city council looked at it. They said, well, okay, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do this. And they accepted the, the ecclesiastical ordinances, passed them into law. Again, a decision of the city council. There had been a new election. A new faction comes back in to, to try to get Calvin back. So, you know, politics is going on here. And Calvin returns to Geneva in 1541. And the ecclesiastical ordinances were, became the law of Geneva, or part of the law of Geneva. And here, just on the slide here on Calvin and Geneva, just uh, a few of the, of the uh, central points of it. The ecclesiastical ordinances established uh, various church offices, offices of the church, pastors, elders, deacons, and teachers. Now, if any of you are, come from the Reformed tradition or the Calvinist tradition, um, this will look very f familiar to you, which you know, I mean, Reformed tradition uh in this country, in the United States today, is the Reformed Church of America. Um, and there's another branch of it, too, uh, which I should know, and I don't, can't think of it at the top of the Christian Reform. So it's the Reformed Church of America and the Christian Reformed Church. Um, and then also the Presbyterians. That's the Scottish form, but definitely a Calvinistic heritage. You will, you will recognize this structure. Pastors, elders, deacons, and teachers. Pastors would be to, to preach and to um, set the theological agenda. Elders were just what they meant the the most senior, prestigious uh, press, members with prestige in the community would be elected and ordained to, as elder to lead and guide the the the, ch the church the community. Deacons um, too um, were these are all male offices. Deacons were those who would take care of the poor. And going back to the, to the Bible and Acts, you know, the, Stephen is one of the first deacons. Um, to to the pastoral care in the community, and then teachers to teach children, adolescents, adults, what they needed to learn. So it's basically Sunday school, um, elders and deacons, and the pastors, and. There was a, would be a company of pastors, meaning of all the pastors in the territory of Geneva, would meet periodically, regularly, to discuss church policy, to discuss any problems that they had, um, and to determine you know how we go forward. And the thing is, we have the notes from the company of pastors. We have the the and they've been edited. And they're in 16th century French. Uh, the, the, they haven't been translated, even though maybe some, a few maybe have been translated some places, but uh, as a body, they have been edited, but they have not been translated. Um, and then there's another administrative body established, namely the consistory. The consistory consisted of the company of pastors and all the elders, so that uh, the company of pastors would meet periodically, and the consistory the pastors and the elders together of all the churches in Geneva would meet. And we have those documents too. We have the minutes and, and the acts of the consistory. Um, and, and Robert Kingdon uh, was at Wisconsin, um, was the, the, the person who kind of started the editorial process on these things and, and, and working. He was a huge figure uh, or was a huge figure in Reformation Studies. And I had the chance to, to work with him for a year uh, in Wisconsin as, as a graduate student. And so yeah, I got to see some of this going on, some of his work that is going on. Um, but the consistory became a very feared organization because the consistory was responsible for discipline, church discipline, and was the judge. If there was a case brought forward of someone not following the rules, so to speak, they could be brought before the consistory. And these rules, not necessarily explicitly outlined in, in the ecclesiastical ordinances, except in, in most general terms, in terms of ethics and moralities, prostitution was outlawed, gambling was outlawed, dancing was shunned. If you, divorce was shunned, except in very particular cases. And to 
receive a divorce, you had to have the approval of the consistory. So if you wanted to, to be granted a, a divorce, you had to appear before the consist consistory and, and present your case. Uh, and Kingdon, Robert Kingdon has a great book uh, on, on divorce and adultery in Calvin's Geneva. Um, and showing that the difference between precept and practice in terms of, you know, Calvin would kind of grant divorces to people he felt you know, that he knew or wanted to, um, and not others. And so it's, it gets to be really problematic. It's one of the major cases. It also points to, to the power and the fear of the consistory. There's a story, too, about someone who was banned from Geneva. Uh, now, banishment was one of the major punishments uh, if you were uh, came into conflict with the moral traditions of the consistory. Uh, you could be banned. That's excommunication. Excommunication was had been there all along in terms of the medieval Christendom. Um, also then with Wittenberg and those things, excommunication was kicking one out of the community. And in Geneva, that meant you have to Leave the city. You could be like, banned for a few years, or you could be banned permanently. And this person was banned permanently. Why was he banned? Because supposedly, as the case has it, he was um, in public. He was in a, a public pissoir. Um, and I don't know if any of you know what a pissoir is or was. I'm not even sure they still have them. Last time I was in France, they did. Um, is kind of like a, a public urinal. For men, um, and it's um, pretty open. It's just on the side of the street. You can kind of go in. We cover you from like your shoulders to your knees. You can go relieve yourself, and then on you go. So it's not private, but it's still it's somewhat private. If that makes sense. And as he was saying that he was in a in a pissoir talking to a friend of his because they usually have two or three entryways. Um, complaining about the pastors. And he says, you know, those pastors, they're not any better Christians than I am. Someone overheard him say that. Reported it to the consistory. He was brought in, hauled in before the consistory, and banished. For that level of critique. This was a time, Cal Geneva, with the consistory under Calvin, a time that sought to control morals and behavior and thoughts at least publicly expressed thoughts. Was it an oppressive state? I think most of us would feel that way. At the time, certainly a lot of people did. But from the, on the other side of the positive view of it, John Knox, for example, who was uh, a Scotsman, he came to Geneva, studied with Calvin, he said, my God, Geneva is the most godly city I've ever seen. Now, I'm not sitting here saying it was a positive or a negative. I'm just talking about that, that the fear of the consistory and the power of the consistory. And it was so significant, too, because the elders, as I said, were the most revered um, citizens in the community who would be chosen as elders. Who do you choose? Who do you elect to the small council? The same people. So that there was almost... Uh, a one-to-one, -one. I don't have the, the statistics, but a very, very close relationship between members of the consistory and members of the small council. So that any decision the consistory could would take would be implemented by the small council. This became too in 1555 uh, when Michael Servetus uh, came through. I don't think I have this uh, anywhere else uh, on the slides for today, so I don't tell the story, but Michael Servetus um, was a, a medical doctor. Uh, actually, he was accredited with uh, discovering the, the pulmonary circulation of the blood. I can't say if he really did or not or whatever, but that, you know, he was a Unitarian. I think I may have mentioned him in a previous lecture. He was a Unitarian. He did, did not believe in the Trinity. He thought that he could convince Calvin. So he goes to Geneva to, to say, Calvin, I'm going to convince you I'm right. Well, Obviously, he, he may have had a lot of, of, of arrogance, um, he, but, but he didn't realize whom he was dealing with. And he was captured um, and brought before the consistory and condemned as a heretic. Then the question was, what do we do with him? And Calvin says, well, you know what? We 
we should be, be clement. We should have mercy, and, and we should just you know, behead him. I mean, heretics have to die. Um, and the city council said, no, you know, we burned heretics. We're going to continue burning heretics, make a public spectacle of it. That's what we're going to do. So even though Calvin was arguing for beheading, Servetus was burned by Calvin in Geneva. And it led to the humanist, Sebastian Castelio, who was there at the time, to say afterwards, you know, to burn a man is not to defend a doctrine. It is simply to burn a man. That sentiment of Castelio's was rare. It was not the norm. It was not what the Reformation unleashed, but quite the opposite. As I'll be arguing as we go through uh, the rest of these lectures, um, the idea that the Reformation brought about toleration and openness is about as ahistorical as it possibly can be, because what it brought about was a far more um, controlling society, persecuting society than it had ever been previously. And Servetus is an example of that. Now, that being said, oh, this is a small council that executes. You know, I, I often say, you know, the church never, never uh, put anyone to death. They condemned people to death, but the actual executioner was, was always the state. Anyway, that made it very convenient for the small council and consistory to be very much on the same page. And also, part of this then too is how do we know what the church is and what do we know uh, with what is the proper morals and this came up uh, not only in ecclesiastical ordinances but also in the Calvinist institute then we what's we refer to as the marks of the church the marks of the church the question was how do we know what is the true church how do we distinguish what is genuinely good Protestant, Calvinistic, biblical doctrine and practice, and what isn't. Calvin said, well, you know, we can identify the true church here on earth. There's a distinction between the, you know, the church triumphant, the heavenly Jer Jerusalem, the church as it will be in heaven, and then the, the temporal church um, in this world. And that goes back to Augustine too. And Augustine knew, or Calvin knew that. But it's very much of, you know, we can still identify the true church here. It's not quite with Augustine that we can't. Augustine was, you know, the city of God and the city of man are completely thoroughly mixed. We have no way of knowing who's who. Calvin says we do. The marks of the pure church, the church, the true church is found wherever there is one pure preaching of the gospel. Two, the correct celebration of the sacraments. And three, discipline. And what is discipline? The control of morals and morality. And once we have these three elements all together being instituted within the structures of the ecclesiastical ordinances, there we can identify as the true church. And other congregations that maybe appear to be the church are not. That gets us to then what is the pure preaching of the gospel and what is the correct administration of the sacraments. Um, I'll come back to that in a later slide when I talk about Calvin's Institutes. Now, I have up there on the slide this point five here with uh, the slide of Calvin in Geneva, the most godly city. And that's what I you know, had already mentioned that John Knox saw it as that this is the city on the hill. We are godly because we are behaving correctly. We are preaching the poor, pure gospel. We have these administrative structures and the ecclesiastical structures in order and the political and everything is working together. And this is just magnificent. Even as Genevans are still kind of like, damn it, these people, what are they doing? There's tension. And all the while, Calvin is still focused on France. Um, he is establishing, and he later establishes an academy in Geneva for the specific training of pastors to go back into France. And so um, it is 
a, a real source of tension in Geneva, even though the city council is going along with Calvin. For the citizenry, there is tension, especially when Geneva becomes the location of a huge influx of immigrants fleeing France. So here we have these foreigners coming in here. What are they doing? There is such controversy in Geneva and tension. And you can almost feel it if you were walking through the streets, even as the city council is behind Calvin. And Calvin has kind of uh, uh, discussed with the Genevans as such, but, you know, he gets to implement his program and he can use it to try to convert France. That's where this concept of the Reformation of the Refugees comes from. This idea of people fleeing from France to Geneva, and then also, as I said, they also did it to London, but then this sense of going back to France. So we can talk about the French Reformation, we can talk about the Reformation of the Refugees. Um, Calvin never really felt comfortable in Geneva. He did not become a citizen until he's almost on his deathbed. He's finally granted citizenship. Um, it is a tense situation for the most godly city. And, uh, not to say what I might believe about things uh, in this life or in the afterlife, but if I were to going to imagine a godly city, a heavenly Jerusalem, it would not be one filled with bitterness and hate and control. That was Geneva, and that was seen as that. And that, that has all kinds of implications, which I'll be talking about later, um, for not just for Calvin, but for Calvinism. And as all isms, there is a huge distinction between the position or the doctrines of the originator and what was made thereof, between Calvin and Calvinism, between Luther and Lutheranism, between... Um, Augustine and Augustinianism, between St. Thomas Aquinas and Thomism. Um, all these isms, which are 19th century German terms, um, deviated from the, their original inspirations. And Calvinism had a huge impact on the development of at least the West. Um, and I'll be addressing some of that later on. But right now we're still with Calvin in Geneva and looking towards France um, and hoping things will work out. Now, I think I'm going to take a break here um, and come back for part two, where I will address the institutes uh, of the Christian religion, at least in brief. Um, and then uh, the French wars of religion and the civil wars in France. So this will get, be another two-part lecture um with with the break um and i'll be back um but we'll just be picking up because the next slide is about the institutes because it was these two pillars for calvin the ecclesiastical ordinances and putting into effect into practice um his view of discipline and, and what makes a godly community in geneva um again looking towards France, but Geneva as the model, creating this model. And then the theological, in some ways philosophical too, the theological um, argument behind it. Because whatever you want to say about Calvin, whatever you want to say about the Institutes, Calvin was a brilliant mind. And the Institutes of the Christian religion are a brilliant piece of work. Even if you don't agree with it, even if you stand against it, even if you see it as the work of the devil, it's still a brilliant work of a brilliant mind. I'll talk about some of that, uh, some of the major positions of this work in the part two of this lecture. We'll get through this. Okay, thanks so much. See you soon. Bye-bye.